chairman, ladies and gentlemen, I'm here again. Uh, I'm surprised we resisted up to now. And now is coming the last touch of the day. And uh, you see that we are entering now in the, in the life of systemic sclerosis. This morning you have heard about what comes before, like basement like tissue disease, like overlap syndrome. But now we are entering in the true disease of systemic sclerosis. Now, what really is difficult is, as, we, as things stand now, and as the clinics are advancing, is the fact that how it's difficult to make an early diagnosis with the present criteria. And I can tell you, to make a diagnosis with the present criteria is almost impossible. But what you would think of, not even an early, but a very early diagnosis of systemic sclerosis. So you know, you, you can be surprised by what I'm telling you now, which is the difference between very early and early. And you will see, I will try to demonstrate to you that today we are able to differentiate between very early and early diagnosis of systemic sclerosis. And you will see throughout my presentation uh, what is the VEROS, so in very early diagnosis of systemic sclerosis, which are the criteria, and also you will see cases live, so that like we are together in the outpatient clinic. So we know that uh, the early diagnosis of systemic sclerosis is challenging. Uh, we talk about rare diseases, but I'm not convinced of this because we don't have the numbers, we don't have the epidemiology, so we are ignorant about this. We know that this is a very complex pathology, probably the most complex of all our diseases in, in uh, rheumatic diseases. It, ha it is really heterogeneous. We are not dealing with lupus. At, at, at least in lupus you understand what's going on under your eyes. You can measure, you can see. Here you don't know because the disease is so unpredictable that sometimes you are taken off balance. And we know very well, very well, this is, this is a fact, that unfortunately the diagnosis of scleroderma is typically delayed. And you see here um, that in reality no significant change in time to diagnosis has been achieved in the past three decades. So that's the reason why improvement is absolutely needed. Because if we may have an early diagnosis, uh, we maybe stop this is that we call evolution in an irreversible obliterative vasculopathy as well as a scarring of the tissue, or you may also clothe this fibrosis of the tissue. So we know stealing this um, terminology from rheumatoid arthritis that we have a window of opportunity to start as soon as possible uh, the treatment to block and slow the disease progression and obviously what do we want to avoid? We want to avoid the damage. It's like we are speaking about rheumatoid, the window of opportunity, we have to block the, the, the evolution to the erosions, here we have to block the, the evolution to scarring. That absolutely can, can look at you like something that is good because scar is the solution of the problem of inflammation but in reality every bit of scar is a loss of function in this patient. So in this chart you see that in reality we have renal phenomenon, we have anti-nuclear antibodies, we have puffy fingers, we have other kind of definitions here that can mislead you, but in reality you have also here capillaroscopy. And capillaroscopy, by chance and by luck at the same time, can really help you in narrow down the diagnosis, as well as the other antibodies can help you to narrow down the diagnosis, as I've shown to you today in the subset of overlap syndromes. This is a work, this is a work, very elegant work, done by the Canadians, by Koenig, uh, just demonstrating that um, when you have capillary modification together with antibodies and renal phenomenon, 
the conclusion is you may have a very high probability of developing definite scleroderma. Now, this is brilliant because they say if you have this, you may have, you, uh, actually you may develop, but in reality, what we have achieved in the last two years mm -hmm. in the group elsewhere in Europe is completely different. When you have these modifications, you don't have the very high probability of developing definite scleroderma. You definitely have scleroderma, but in a very early phase. Now, we are sitting here all together, and let me make you this question. You don't have to push anything, but just think. What do you personally think is the most indicative element here for developing systemic sclerosis? Just think. And when you look at these, I can give you an answer now. So everything of these nine signs and symptoms is part of the clinical picture of systemic sclerosis. So the problem is how you put them together in time, because the time is what we really have in front of us when we are dealing with a patient with systemic sclerosis, in particular, the very early phase. So you see renal phenomenon, puffy finger, ANA positivity, Okay, they full capillaroscopy modification, even sclerodactyly, esophageal reflux. You remember this morning when I told you about the importance of esophageal reflux and hypomotility in MCTD. Pulmonary fibrosis, reduction of pulmonary function tests on the DLCO, as well as the ground glass appearance and the high resolution computer tomography. In 2009, we published this paper just saying it's time to change. This is a Gordian knot. I don't know how much you're familiar with this story, but it's time to change. We need to prevent, not the disease, but at least we have to prevent, the, <coughs> have a secondary prevention of the disease evolution, and have a rescue strategy of those patients who are unfortunately affected by these diseases. And we propose this criteria. This was 2009. You see, major renal phenomenon antibodies with specific antibodies, modification of the video capillaroscopy, and then other criteria like calcinosis, puffy finger, digital ulcer, dysfunction of the esophageum, telegyptasia, and ground glass at the CT scanning, the lung CT scan. This was in 2009. And then we started a uh, work. We started a uh, a work, a European work, about the identification of a core set of preliminary items for the diagnosis of very early systemic sclerosis. And so we gathered all the 170 centers in the world about uh, taking care of scleroderma, and we ended up with five items. Capillary abnormalities, antitoporizomerase antibodies, anticentromere antibodies, and ANA, obviously, together, puffy swollen digits turning into scleroactyly, and renal phenomena. So these are the signs that are most important that have been identified by the biggest expert in the world to be very important in the very early phase of the disease. And after this work has been done, we have gathered all together again, and we have analyzed everything, and this is the time frame, the time frame positioning of these five elements to make a very early diagnosis of scleroderma. And you see here, red flags. You are a doctor. Patient comes to you and says, doctor, I have renal phenomenon. You look at his fingers, and he has puffy fingers. You ask for ANA, and you find positive ANA. This does not tell you that this patient has systemic sclerosis. You can leave it, leave it, leave it, leave it, leave it. So we... We'll... And uh, at the end of the day, this is just a red flag. It's warning you. It's warning you. Here we are in the world of connective tissue disease. And how can we go further on? Very simple. 
we have capillaroscopy and specific serology. So the moment the capillaroscopy is modified and serology clearly shows you that the patient has a TOPO1 antibody or a centromere antibody, together with renal phenomenon, puffy finger, and ANA, at this point, from a suspicion, you move on to what we call very early systemic sclerosis. Obviously, you have to run all the organ investigation. If all the organ investigation that are here are negative, you remain in the area of very early systemic sclerosis without organ involvement. If you find positivity in these three, and uh, obviously this is almost in all patients, you see here a classic renal phenomenon. This is simple, you see. Uh, usually it's red, then become, I'm sorry, this is, uh, becomes white, then becomes red, reperfusion, and then um, becomes blue, I'm sorry, anoxia, and then becomes red, that is reperfusion. But as I told you, what really changed a lot in our profession is capillaroscopy. And when you think you're not, you, know, not, you are in your office and you look at the patient like this, what do you think? What is the most important complication that I have to avoid? I just listed six of them. Uh, I don't know how many of you were with me tomorrow when with Dr. El Azizi and Dr. Farah we, we invested, we, we, uh, we visited a patient with scleroderma with um, uh, ultrasound because now she's complaining about arthritis. But you see here we have digital ulcers, pulmonary hypertension, cardiac arrhythmias that lead to ventricular fibrillation, progression of skin sclerosis, arthritis, and intestinal dysmotility. So you have a lot here. And what are you fighting? You are fighting everything. You are fighting to avoid this to become reality in your patient. So digital ulcer that start like this and then become a disaster up to amputation. And we know also that capillaroscopy today may even be able to predict the uh, appearance, to predict the appearance of digital ulcer. This is called the capillaroscopic skin ulcer risk index. And also we know that today we can try to prevent with drugs. In this case, this is an endothelium receptor antagonist. This was the first trial, rapid one. This is the second rapid one trial, where we have demonstrated that with this drug, we can slow down the recurrence of digital ulcers. And this is also the demonstration that if we really catch pulmonary artery hypertension in the early phase, we can stop the passage from the, the New York, uh, the NIA class, uh, class from 1, 2, to 3, and 4. So the diagnosis of scleroderma in the early phase today is possible. And you have to think, I was in 2004. So nothing of what I have told you was, I mean, I, I thought about this, but I did not have yet the idea how to do it. So in 2004, I was thinking what I should do to this patient. Should I treat her with cyclophosphamide, with azathioprine, with methotrexate, whatever you want. So I spoke with the lady and she said, you know what, I want children. So do whatever you want, but let me have children. So you see, at those times, 2004, I said, okay, I give you only basonactive uh, drugs. I gave her cartridge channel blockers, and you will see the result now. This is another lady. She came last year to us. She has renal phenomenon, ANA and top isomerase 1. She has a late capillaroscopy. She has a, uh, a CT scanning, totally normal. She has a FVC and DLC on normal. She has puffy finger. And I say, my lady, I'm sorry, everything is normal here. I see a, a late capillaroscopy, so it means the disease is already somehow in the, in the vascular system is already advanced. 
But, but clinically, I can't find anything, almost anything. So by chance, we were running a program for MRI. And uh, so we launched a program for MRI, uh, for heart MRI, but our colleagues also run now a, a lung MRI. So this is the lung MRI. Uh, and I'm sorry, Dr. Far again, for presenting this. This picture that are absolutely unique from, from the MRI point of view, uh, because you are a specialist of MRI, you can comment on this. But my colleagues sent me this and said, you know what, here at the basal level, we have some enhancement here, but uh, you will see now which is the heart of this patient. These are other two patients, 2004 and 2005. This is a beautiful, very beautiful, tall uh, Alitalia stewardess. She was flying and she comes to me for a no phenomenon with ANA, top isomerase 1, and an active capillaroscopy. The other one comes to me for a no phenomenon ANA, centromere positive, positivity, and an early capillaroscopy. ANA and specific antibodies, capillaroscopy. So you have them, and you know that if you use them, probably you can screen the patient. And also you know that you don't want to see this. Because when fibrosis is mature and evolves at the end in atrophy in the advanced phases, you don't, you can't do anything anymore. And you see here, this is the picture of Paul Clay before he died. And in this picture you, you see very well this face is a, is a, is a white face. Because at the end of the disease, they become white, like wax. And you see here it's written T O D, that in German means death. So if you have to strike the patient, you have to strike the patient here before he, became, he becomes a prisoner in the cage of scleroderma, the fibrotic cage that unfortunately will not give him any more hope to recover a normal life and an acceptable quality of life. So you have to strike the iron when it is hot. For this reason, we have launched all together with USTAR and with the foundation now um, a new program, in particular, the program that we call very early diagnosis of systemic sclerosis that we have developed in the whole world now uh, to achieve the early diagnosis of scleroderma. And as I told you this morning, I'm here again because my co-workers help me every day to do what alone I cannot do. Thank you very much again for your time. And uh, sorry, by the way, if I was arrested, this is the next second Systemic Sclerosis World Congress that will take place in Madrid in February next year. Thank you very much. Thank you.